Good evening. Before I introduce Homer, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who was able to come to the Tree Ring Lab last month for our field trip. And I wanted to remind everyone to please check our website for upcoming field trips and all of the lectures as soon as we get our speakers confirmed are also posted. Um, I'm really excited to introduce Homer tonight. We met a few, more than a few years ago back when I worked up at Tumamock Hill and he gave a lecture there. And so I was really excited to have him lined up for tonight's lecture. And Homer is, Homer Thiel, is a native of uh, Michigan, actually. And he got his undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan. And his uh, master's degree was from that other school in Arizona that we don't mention. <laughs> but we'll forgive him for that. Um, he has been employed at Desert Archaeology as the historical archaeologist since 1992. And in his uh, spare time, he does gene genealogical research, he bakes cakes, and he picks up after his two cats and dogs, in which he was, they're very cute. We saw pictures of them at dinner. And so I'm, I'm really excited to introduce him tonight to present about the archaeology of the Court Street Cemetery. So I hope you enjoy the talk. So the, uh, this quote is from a newspaper article. Uh, when they opened up the Court Street Cemetery, the people living in Tucson hated it because it was so ugly. Um, because uh, the area where the cemetery was had a lot of caliche underneath it, and they couldn't get any trees or bushes to grow. So the newspaper complained about what a horrible thing it was to put our loved ones in a drear, bleak, desolate place. So. I'm going to jump back in time before the Court Street Cemetery. Let's see if I can figure out how to make this go. That's not how I make it go. <laughs> to the Presidio Cemetery. Um, so, in 1775, the Presidio San Augustine de Tucson was founded in uh, the location was selected in what is now downtown Tucson. And later that year, um, by the end of the year, there were soldiers up there building the fort. And one of the first things they did was build a church. And they had a cemetery both outside around the church and inside the church beneath the floor. And this was a consecrated Catholic church, of course. And the individuals that were buried in that church were buried wrapped in cloth shrouds. Most of them did not have any clothes because Clothes were so expensive that when you died, your children or your friends or your family members got your clothing. Um, the oldest known coffin we know of for sure was in 1851. Little kids were buried uh, wearing floral, uh, artificial flower crowns on their heads because they were considered innocent and they would go straight to heaven and not go to purgatory. If you were not Catholic, which hardly anybody wasn't Catholic here, or if they found a body out in the desert, you wouldn't be buried in the cemetery. And when they um, did the archaeology for the YMCA downtown, they found a pair of guys buried off the, away from the cemetery. Um, one of whom had a uh, Apache arrowhead stuck in his spine. Let's see. So that cemetery was in use until the mid 1850s, and then uh, one aspect of it was that it, you know over that time period of, of 80 some years somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 people were buried in a very small space. We don't have the burial record books because they were taken to Mexico, and the story is that the soldiers tore up the record books to make cigarettes on the way to Mexico when they left in 1856. So the next cemetery was at the corner of Stone and Speedway, Stone, Stone and uh, Alameda and Stone, where the new courthouse complex is. And statistical research excavated those uh, bodies in 2007 and 2008. Um, let's see. The little area with the very crowded graves is probably the original civilian cemetery. It's consecrated Catholic ground. Down towards the bottom is the military cemetery. And then they started burying people in rows. Um, most people were buried in coffins uh, because wood became more available once the Americans arrived and uh, the Apache attacks sort of subsided. You'd go up in the mountains and have uh, sawmills. It was still somewhat dangerous, but less so than it had been. In 1874, the first professional undertaker arrived in Tucson and started preparing bodies. Previous to that, 
when you die, your family members and friends would uh, take care of you. The cemetery, uh, eventually, uh, there was a decision that it was too close to downtown. The trains were going to be eventually coming through this area, so they closed the civilian portion in 1875 and the military portion in 1881. Most of the military burials were subsequently uh, dug up and moved out to Fort Lowell. Most of the civilian bodies were left in place, and when Statistical did its excavation, they found over 1,100 graves uh, that were still there with people in them. So uh, in 1875, they opened up the Court Street Cemetery. They actually didn't call it that. That's a later name. Um, it really never had a specific name. It was called by whatever particular plot you were buried in, which could include the Catholic portion, which was the east half of the cemetery, four city blocks. The next two blocks uh, to the west were the city, county, public, pauper uh, burial ground. And then there were about seven or eight um, fraternal groups, uh, including the Tucson Firemen, the uh, Improved Order Odd Fellows, which was a temperance group, the Masons, the Workers of the World, uh, a Jewish group, and the Improved Order of Red Men which was a group of men who liked to get together once a month and party. And ironically enough, uh, if you were Native American, you were not allowed to join. <laughs> there are no uh, complete burial records for the cemetery. We have the Catholic burial records, but even those are not complete because if you were a Catholic person and wanted to bury someone in the cemetery and didn't want to go to the church, you just went up there and dug a hole and stuck them in. Um, and I've been doing research, uh, Chris Lang, has helped me out on this, where we read through all the uh, death certificates between 1898 and 1909, as well as a variety of other records, and we think somewhere between 8,000 and 9,000 people were buried in the cemetery. So in 1907, uh, Mr. Drockman, who owned the property to the north, which is now uh, the Pima Community College, um, he, of course, did not like the fact that there was a cemetery right south of him because it really, uh, cost his property to be undervalued. So he and some of the other businessmen thought of this great idea. Hey, let's start a new cemetery over on Oracle Road. Uh, we'll call it uh, Evergreen. And one aspect of that portion of town is that it's in a sort of a floodplain area and you could actually plant trees and they would actually grow with minimal uh, irrigation. As well, you could charge people 50 bucks to dig up uh, their bodies that were in this Court Street Cemetery and move them over there. And knowing that there were thousands of people, the little dollar signs uh, flashed for their eyes and how many thousands of dollars they could make moving bodies. Um, and then there was the, the aspect of that you could develop the land afterwards. And so, uh, so in 1907, they finally convinced the city that let's uh, close the cemetery. And it was closed in 1909. And then in 1915, they started advertising, come and remove the bodies of your friends and family members. And the following year, the property was developed. And currently, there are something like 80 houses. There's a hotel, an apartment complex um, on top of these bodies. And if you happen to have a house in the Catholic portion of the cemetery, um, based on the average size of the house lots, you have somewhere between 90 and 100 graves underneath your house. <laughs> and of course they did the poltergeist thing, where in many cases they moved the tombstones and not the bodies. And then there were those people that had wooden uh, tombstones, and there was a newspaper article describing how these uh, two little boys had been going and stealing the wood tombstones to heat their house with their elderly grandmother who was sick. So a lot of people, uh, you couldn't locate their graves because the, the tombstones were gone, or the people that had come to Tucson seeking a cure from tuberculosis and had died without any family members or friends here. There was nobody uh, to move their bodies. Since 1949, over 50 graves have been found, and since 2005, I've worked on 22 graves. So who were the people buried in the cemetery? The cemetery was open for 34 years, the earlier uh, records from 1875 to 1885, I've had to rely on things like newspaper articles and the Catholic Church burial records and a few other sources. Um, and I have a database of about 9,600 entries, but there are duplicate entries when I have an entry from one source and another. So this, these are numbers, of course, could change, but there were quite a few fewer females than males, and this reflected 
the fact that there were a lot of single men coming out to work in Tucson who uh, subsequently died. And a lot of these uh, single men are people with tuberculosis that came out hoping for a cure in the dry climate. And a lot of them died and were buried in the cemetery. The average age, age of death was almost 26 years because of the high child mortality. Um, and the median age of death, if you divided it up in half, was 22 years. So half the people in the cemetery died before they were uh, 23, basically. If you live to age 10, you could expect to live to 44, 20, you could expect to live to 47. This is depressing. If you live to 30, you could expect to live to 53 and a half. Uh, in terms of ethnicity, of course, uh, we're living in an area with a lot of Mexican Americans, and about two thirds of the people in the cemetery were of Mexican origin. Um, another uh, couple thousand were European Americans, and then s smaller sets of other people, including 49 Chinese people, five Japanese people, and we even had a number of Native Americans. Most Native Americans tend to be buried uh, on their home uh, lands. But for some reason or other, uh, people from all these different uh, nations and tribes were buried in the cemetery. And I'm going to have you memorize all these numbers, and afterwards I'll get a test. <laughs> these are the uh, I had to, I had to go to the CDC website to see how how deaths were defined, and so uh, this is yeah very uh, lengthy. But tuberculosis was the main killer, and I have uh, 754 people out of the approximately 9,000, although I don't have death, causes of death for everybody. And this is just the people buried in the cemetery. There were a lot of people who died who were subsequently shipped back to wherever their uh, home city was. And in the uh, Parker funeral records that I have access to, uh, that's very common to see people being shipped all over the country. And in, in fact, in one case, being shipped back to Europe. Uh, a lot of these is things that cause people to die today would be cured with a shot, either a vaccine or an antibiotic shot. For instance, uh, diarrhea, gastroenteritis, or dysentery, uh, 356 people, mostly children, but a little child with diarrhea back then, they had no way to stop it, and you would basically become dehydrated and die. Very sad. Uh, there are infectious diseases. There's only 12 people with smallpox listed in the cemetery, and that's because there was a separate smallpox pest house out at Silver Bell and I think Grant or Speedway, I can't remember. And if you got smallpox, if you got a came in here on the train and you had evidence for smallpox, they'd put you in a wagon and drag you off to the pest house. And if there were too many people in the pest house, they would put up tents, and you were forced to stay there until you became non-contagious or died. And there was a cemetery out there at the pest house. And sometime in the late 1960s, uh, the developer who developed the property um, had them dug up and moved to either Evergreen or Holy Hope. But no one seems to know which one. <laughs> Cancers. Uh, the interesting thing about these uh, causes of death listed here is how uh, few things that kill people today. Because people didn't live long enough to get the things that we died from. So out of those uh, approximately 9,600 people that I have listings for, only 1% died from cancer. And I'm sure today that's be a lot higher. You get surprising things like malnutrition, people dying from that. Um, peritonitis, which killed one of my great-grandfathers. Um, it's a blood infection caused by uh, being injured, and then your, uh, the, the uh, infection gets into your bloodstream. So, uh, today I think they call it sep sepsis, something like that. Uh, strokes were very common. Um, it goes by a number of different names, but uh, uh, if you had a, had a stroke, almost always you died soon afterwards. Uh, pneumonia was a big killer because uh, people didn't have antibiotics back then. You also get things like liver disease or cirrhosis from uh, the guys that were partying too hard, the mm -hmm. red men that were drinking too much. And actually several of the red men in the death records uh, died from uh, drinking too much. And then there are uh, a number of women that died both in childbirth or from uh, infection as a result, or from having a miscarriage. And the miscarriage thing might be women that died from having an abortion, uh, as well as the little kids that were dying. Um, if you were a premature birth as a child, you almost certainly would die very quickly. There were lots of stillborns 
probably from women who had poor nutrition. And then there's this uh, thing called marasmus, or, uh, which basically the child didn't thrive for some reason and would die. Very few people died from old age, uh, only again about 1%. And then there are the other causes. Uh, accidents, lots of accidents. Lots of people, uh, if you worked on the train, the worst job would be the, the guys that were hooking the cars together because they were always being crushed in between the cars. Or the, the guys, the brakemen, who would fall off while the train is moving and get run over. Um, legal executions. L later this month on the 27th, I'm giving a talk on the six legal executions in Pima County for the Presidio Trust. Um, and there's five of those guys that were hung that are buried in the cemetery. And then there's the homicides. And this gunshots include uh, both people that were killed uh, on purpose, some killed by the police, and there's also some individuals in that category that were killed by accident, little kids playing with guns. So in 1875, or 1874, uh, E.J. Smith shows up. He was the first undertaker. He had previously lived in Hawaii, and I found uh, advertisements for his undertaking business in Hawaii. And then he went down to uh, Colombia to uh, look for gold, and he actually found, in a stream, he found gold fish hooks, and those are currently in the Smithsonian Institution. Um, and he sold his undertaking business to Samuel Bard, and in the probate files of Pima County, you have all these undertaker's bills, and here is one for Captain Weber, who died in 1889. And his funeral bill says his burial case, which is the coffin, was $35. The outside box, which is a vault box that you put the coffin inside, is $5. Opening and closing the grave, which means digging and then filling it back in, was $5. And washing, dressing, and Preparing remains for burials was $20. And then a hearse to take the, the body to the cemetery is $15. So his funeral in 1889 cost a total of $80. And there are dozens of these bills uh, in the probate files of Pima County with an elaborate letterhead. And they give you a good sense of how much people were willing to spend. If you were a pauper and died, the county would uh, pay between six and twelve dollars to bury your body and you've got a fancy not a fancy coffin you got the plainest one possible and uh, the coroner was required to bury you and there was a complaint that one of the coroners was only putting six inches of dirt on top of coffins and the coyotes were getting down into them so in 1915 there's advertisements uh, in the newspaper asking people to come and dig up bodies and move them uh, Local undertaking parlors advertise that they would do it for you. Um, here's one uh, for one of the fraternal groups, the Knights of Pythias. Uh, in general, the, the fraternal groups probably had a greater chance of being uh, exhumed and moved than the other groups because uh, they maintained small cemetery plots and the people uh, who were members still were, remembered these individuals and would go and uh, remove them. And if you go over to Evergreen, there's you can still see some of these uh, plots with uh, tombstones from this time period that have been moved as well. So this is a map of the cemetery uh, with Speedway on the top and Stone Avenue on the right side and Main Avenue on the left and then Second Street is a southern boundary. And each of those little dots is one of the burials that has been found since probably the late 1960s. The uh, ones that I'll be talking about, there's, there's two sort of black ovals. That's the Redmond plot. We uh, found that cemetery area. I mean, Chris worked on that as well, I think, yes. And actually, one of the interesting things, we actually found pit houses there. And this is quite a ways away from the river, and so it was a very unexpected place to find pit houses. Uh, up in the corner, there used to be a bank building, and those two burials were found underneath what had been the floor of the bank. Um, and then you will see a scatter of other ones that have been found. So these are found by homeowners doing work. Uh, there's a guy that was putting in his uh, new uh, mailbox and hit a burial, called the police. They took the bones down to the Pima County medical examiner, and the medical examiner for some reason said, oh, I think these are dog bones. And then the guy went and started digging more and hit the skull. 
so the police were called again, and I thought to myself, whoever was working at the Pima County uh, Medical Examiner's <laughs> office needs to go and take osteology again. Um, other ones were found uh, during sewer repair work, where uh, either a sewer line broke or recently uh, Pima County had all the sewer pipes, uh, which are ceramic or metal in the area, relined where they could put this plastic sleeve on the inside, but they had to open up certain areas to uh, get down to problem areas of the pipe where they're either broken or for access. Uh, the bank area on the upper right, we cleared that so eventually it can be developed. And the Redmond plot, we first found it and then we excavated 10 of the graves uh, because uh, the Salvation Army was trading a portion of the, the Alder Avenue to the city of Tucson in exchange for that area. So I'll tell you about some of the bodies that we found. So back in 2007, a uh, homeowner uh, found a sinkhole in his front sidewalk area, if there had been an actual sidewalk, but it was just dirt. And so he stuck his shovel in the ground, and when he pulled it out, there were these diamond-shaped brass items and then little bones. And this guy's wife was a pediatrician, so he went in the house with his handful of bones, and she took one look and said, well, that's a little kid. And they kind of knew that their house was built on top of the cemetery, but they never expected that they were actually graves still there. So because the uh, uh, burials were in the city of Tucson's right-of-way, the city of Tucson was required to pay to have them removed. And so myself and, an, and another woman that worked with us went there, and we started excavating. And the, the first thing we found was that, yes, it was a child's burial in a uh, hexagonal coffin. The child was buried, uh, lying extended with his hands crossed, or her hand, one of the sex, on top of the pelvis. Uh, there were buttons running down the spine, suggesting that the kid was wearing a dress. There were nine, I think 12 buttons total. There was also some buttons at the head where they had wadded up a garment to make a pillow. And the weird thing was at the base, there was a whole bunch, I think about 30 buttons, from four different garments that had been stuffed into the foot of the coffin. So what was that all about? And uh, it's, of course, the ship grave shaft was cut into the caliche, and so we could see there was a caliche on three of the four sides of the grave, but there was no caliche at the bottom underneath the base of the coffin. These are some of the buttons that came out of the grave. You can see there's a, quite a different variety of buttons. So there was no caliche uh, at the bottom of the grave, so I took my trowel, took one scrape, and oh, look, there's another head down below. And underneath was the body of a 30 to 35 year old male in a larger coffin, of course, because he was taller, he was somewhere between 5'2 like and 5'5 five, five feet tall. The coffins had identical hardware, so they were from the same uh, uh, undertaking parlor. They slapped the same hardware on the coffin. In his case, one of the handles had come off the coffin and had been tossed into the bottom of the grave, and then the coffin dropped on the top. Uh, one of the unusual physical anthropology things about this particular guy was that he had an extra thoracic vertebrae and extra thoracic uh, ribs, which is a genetic anomaly that occurs in a certain small percentage of the population. He would never actually know that he had these extra ribs um, and vertebrae, but uh, yes, that was pretty cool. And then there was another weird thing. He had stuff in his pockets. And people are not buried with their pocket contents. People go through your pockets to make sure you don't have anything, you know, like money in your pockets. In his uh, uh, right-hand pocket, he had three coins. I think the, the most recent was from 1887. And he had a hard rubber cone. And in his uh, other pocket, he had a uh, fabric coin purse with a, a brass clasp and some sort of metal tube that we couldn't figure out what it was, and a nice jackknife with a mother of pearl uh, inlay on the handle. That, and the knife had two blades on it. So again, we had this weird situation where this person was buried with stuff in his pockets that shouldn't be there. And the most likely explanation is that these two individuals died from some horrible, uh, contagious disease and they were being put in the ground as quick as possible. The little kid had extra garments because they knew that uh, infectious diseases could be spread in clothing, especially if the clothing had stuff like vomit or diarrhea on them. Uh, the man, they 
they put him in the ground while I was looking through his pockets because they didn't want to catch anything. And then on the south side of the grave, we never did find Kalichi. We took a pin flag and stuck in and it went all the way in about 18 inches. And so the likelihood was that there were additional graves or bodies in, uh, extending that way. But there was a large tree growing on top, and so it was decided just to leave that there. And since this time, the homeowner has put a, a, a nice uh, altar there with a statue of St. Francis in it. It's on Perry Street if you want to see it. So underneath the bank building, we did this thing where the city wanted to clear the property. So we dug uh, stripping trenches, seven foot wide trenches with a five foot area of back dirt in between. Because we know the average length of a grave is six feet and most of them are east-west. And so we knew that by doing so, we would uh, hit every single grave. And again, I think, Chris, did you help on this? Yes, she, she's helped me a lot. So we found two graves that had originally been under the floor of the um, uh, bank. One had been, uh, well, when they did the exhumation project uh, back in 1915, they did it during the summer. And so you can imagine how disgusting it was to bust open these uh, uh, coffins. And some of these people had only been dead for a few years. And so one person, they had just removed the head and left everything else. This particular person, they left behind most of the uh, bones from the left-hand side. And we know that it was an undertaker that did this because scattered in the coffin were about seven or eight undertaking bottles. Embalmer Supply Company. And we know from an inquest case that I've studied that it takes about two of these bottles to embalm a person in this time period. And the newspapers describe, um, wow, this person is so well preserved through the embalming process that they will be around as long as the pyramids. <laughs> um, that's, yeah. In 2011, uh, or 12, uh, when Pima County was redoing that sewer project, we uh, had to monitor areas, and of course we ended up finding uh, 11 graves, seven of which we excavated. In this case, uh, you can see a, a complete burial, and unfortunately it was struck by the back row of a woman in a very plain, undecorated coffin. And then a, a person that had been exhumed in this other grave, with all the coffin hardware still in there, and just a handful of bones, in every single grave that we've dug that's been exhumed, we find human remains. They never completely cleared out the, the bodies. There's always hand and foot bones, but in some cases, some cases you find like large pieces. And again, they were digging down, in some cases, six feet down. They were busting open the wooden vault, then busting open the coffin, and then reaching down in and pulling what they could out. You always find clothing remains uh, that are left behind as well as the smaller bones, and the coffins, uh, with one exception, are uh, there. In uh, one of the, one of the uh, burials that we dug up from this time period, we found a Joff's Tears, which is a kind of uh, plant seed rosary. And in the nearby grave, there was a small, uh, what originally would have been a picture of a saint. Of course, it, it, all that was left was the broken glass in the frame. The uh, improved order of Redmond plot, was used for only 11 years, and we have uh, death certificates or newspaper articles for 16 people, which is one child, uh, two or three women, and the rest were men. Uh, and when we went out there in 2015, we excavated 10 graves. One of the graves was uh, a case where they had been digging a grave and hit another uh, already existing coffin, so they just left it, they, they didn't put anybody in. And of the other nine, seven had been exhumed, and there were two that had not been exhumed. And these two were both of small children. And here, of course, is our typical maps that we draw showing the coffin in place, and then the second one has the little kid. Uh, uh, this, it was unusual that the coffin was so well preserved there was no dirt inside of it. It was just a, the skeletal remains of a child um, aged about two years old who had died from, it looks like a, probably a horse kicked him in the head. And the child was buried wearing a dress. And again, we can't tell sex from the skeletal remains and the fact that the child had a dress on doesn't really mean much because boys and girls wore dresses back then. I have a photograph of 
my grandfather taken when he was four years old wearing a dress, and he always hated that picture. Because his mother also had put little bows in his head. This child was buried wearing his diaper, or her diaper, as we had the, uh, some fragments of the cloth and the brass safety pin still in place. And then there's, of course, the profile drawing. Here are the buttons from the dress, and, and on his uh, feet had been a pair of slippers put on. So, now I'm going to go through and tell you, show you pictures of basically the, what happens. So, uh, say you died back then, and you went either out to the cemetery yourself to dig a grave, or you hired an undertaker who hired somebody for about $5 to dig the grave. Uh, they would have to, about maybe six inches of topsoil was present, and below that was the caliche, and so you had to use pry bars uh, to dig out the dirt. And so on this particular photo, you can actually see the pry bar marks on the sides of the grave shaft. And if the grave shaft was six feet deep, um, which they often were, you might find little uh, footholds cut into the side of the shaft so that people could climb in and out as they were uh, cutting it. And then most of the people were buried inside of uh, wooden vaults. These started uh, during this time period the cemetery was in use. And most of the people that we found so far are in them. And they're basically a rectangular box that you would set the coffin inside and then put the lid on and nail it shut. And that was because uh, people started viewing coffins as almost like pieces of furniture. They were expensive items and you didn't want the dirt to get on top of them. It was considered both uh, poor taste to put a bunch of dirt on top of this expensive coffin that you just paid for, as well as um, it helped protect the body more. If you were going to pay someone to embalm the body, you'd also want to, you know, better preserved. We find both coffins and caskets. Caskets are just basically more elaborately decorated uh, coffins. Um, from probate records, we know that local carpenters were making coffins prior to the arrival of the railroad in 1880. Um, and there were very few uh, coffins in the Alameda Stone Cemetery that had any hardware, maybe seven or eight. But uh, once the railroad got here in 1880, they could uh, very uh, quickly and easily import large amounts of coffin hardware. And there were a number of manufacturing companies in the Midwest and the East Coast that were making very elaborate hardware. Um, from the wood that we find, almost all the wood is imported. Douglas fir is the most common. We also have a coffin made out of walnut. And there were metallic coffins, basically iron coffins, that are noted in probate files, but we have not actually found one of those yet. Um, the one case that I know of was a woman that was murdered, and they found her in the middle of, it must have been October, but it been a hot October, and she was horribly, uh, well, you can guess. Mm -hmm. And so they put her in a very expensive uh, iron coffin uh, to get rid of her. We have funeral home records from the Parker Funeral Home. And they had a list of the coffins and showed that there was a variety of different styles. You could go into the parlor and they'd have a display. You could order a coffin. The very cheapest ones for little kids were basically cardboard boxes that were a dollar. The most expensive were the $500 metallic coffins. <coughs> the average price was $113, uh, but the median price was $40. And the reason why the average price is so much higher is that uh, a lot of people that were dying and being shipped out were being shipped out in the more expensive uh, airtight coffins because the railroad did not want coffins that would leak, basically. Uh, they came in different shapes. Uh, these are the four most common shapes they had at the Alameda Stone Cemetery, and we have found the first and second and the fourth one so far in the Court Street Cemetery. And sometimes, what you can't see in profiles, the coffins were narrower at the base and then would uh, be wider at the top and then uh, uh, have a also beveled uh, lid. So what do you find on these coffins? Well, one thing you find are things called top fasteners. These basically are the closures that close the lid so you didn't have to nail them down. Um, we have a guy named Jeremy Pye from Florida and he has an extensive collection of over 1,200 coffin catalogs. And so when we find coffin parts, we take a picture and send it to him, and then he finds us the corresponding coffin hardware catalog picture. So you will be seeing quite a few of these as we go through. So if you didn't use a top uh, 
fastener, you could use a thumb screw, a thumb screw or and a scutcheon to close up the uh, coffin. And these will be found along the edge of the, the coffin. The scutcheon is the plate uh, that sits on the surface, and then the the thumb screw is the portion that's screwed down to close the lid onto the uh, coffin. And here again, you can see uh, uh, one that has a cross on it. And I'll be talking about that in a moment, the difference between these. And the other ones are elaborate. They're made from a white metal. Sometimes they're gilded or painted silver. So you also need something to open and close the lid uh, at the funeral before they you know, come in for the viewing. And these are called cap lifters. And here on the left is a pair of bluebirds that are actually painted blue that were on a child's coffin. And then on the right is a more uh, geometric one that was on an adult coffin. And if you wanted to actually uh, uh, have a closed coffin but still wanted to see the person, you have viewing windows. And this is the child that I pointed out, the two-year-old child that had been kicked in the head. And here you can see the viewing pane sitting on top of the coffin, uh, the child in the coffin as it fell down, there would be a wooden panel above it that would slide back and forth that would be screwed down when the coffin was closed. Uh, here's a coffin still in the ground, and you can see in the corner are corner braces that help uh, strengthen the interior of the coffin. This is important in this particular case because the person who was buried there was probably a, a pretty big, a tall guy. There are four different types of handles. Adult coffins tend to have four to six handles, although some of them have eight if the person was particularly heavy. You might have the three along each side and then uh, one each on the front and back. Children's coffins often have four handles. This is what's called a swing bail handle. This is typical for ch children's coffins because they are um, the coffins aren't very heavy, so these are the, sort of the ones you can use in a lightweight coffin. And the one on the right is from that, again, that two-year-old's coffin, and it has the word Our Darling on the handle. Um, and this is actually was probably a very expensive coffin that was, uh, as you'll see in a moment. Then there's a variety of other types of candles and handles. And here again, we have the archaeological example and the example from the uh, hardware catalogs. And although the catalogs are dated, what we tend to find is the same uh, design was used over a 10 or 20 year period, so they're not really uh, useful in terms of dating the variables. Luckily from the uh, uh, Redmond plot, we know exactly how many years it was used for 11 years, so we have some idea there. And that's very helpful uh, in terms of dating other uh, variables. Here's a, a drop handle that was present at the end of a coffin and another one uh, that was present on the end of the coffin. And then if, uh, if you were afraid that the handles were not going to be enough because the person was heavy enough that they might actually, handles might rip out, you have uh, handhold covers at the base that allow somebody to be walking um, with their hands like this helping to hold up the coffin. On the exterior of the coffin, you find decorative tacks and studs that were used to attach fabric onto the exterior of the coffin. And according to the Parker funeral records, most coffins had fabric on the outside at this time period. And they come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Um, in the Catholic portion of the cemetery, we find a lot of religious symbolism on the coffin hardware. So on the left is a, a very dramatic cross with a woman clutching it, and we found fragments of that, as well as on the right-hand side is a cross with an uh, open Bible on it. And then in the Redmond plot, the Redmond were partiers. I mean, the main thing they did was have parties once a month where they all get drunk and smoke cigars and give speeches and sing, and then whenever there was a parade, they would show up wearing sort of stereotypical Native American uh, outfits. Um, Probably half the men in the cemetery died from cirrhosis of the liver or from some alcohol-related accident. So they only had secular ornaments on their coffins. Um, here's a plaque that says, at rest, um, from one coffin, and a uh, white metal uh, cattle lily found on another. The outside of the coffin could be painted. Sometimes they were painted with stencil, decorations, fabric, elaborate wood molding, uh, and those applied metal decorations.
I'm not sure if you can see it very well, but there's blue paint here. This is the actual uh, shaft of the grave, and the blue paint is stuck where we pulled the wood off on the outside. Here is a um, uh, one of these brass decorations on the foot of a coffin. It's a, uh, a cross again, and you can see behind it is the fabric uh, that was preserved by the corrosion of the metal. And here is the coffin, and I think this coffin belonged to a guy named Benjamin Fairbank. And the sort of ironic thing was that when Statistical did the dig at the uh, uh, courthouse site, they actually dug up this guy's house. And in 1901, he was riding in his buggy with his wife, and the um, wheel of his buggy went into the streetcar track through and tipped over, and he was thrown off and his head crushed. And he was a big guy. And this coffin was, I think, six foot six uh, long. It's got the uh, elaborate wood molding, you can see. Um, there were eight handles, these three, and the two on the end. It had the internal braces. And then on the corners are these very unusual uh, gutta percha griffins. Uh, this is a mixture of glue and sawdust that's pressed into a mold and then uh, was attached with uh, screws. And Jeremy Pye, the coffin guy, said that he had never ever seen these before and they appear in none of his catalogs. It was the first of the kind that he had seen. So uh, this is a very, very expensive coffin and probably unique. The little kid that was two years old, this is their coffin. And you can see it's got the, uh, they call it chamfered, where it's wider at the top and uh, narrower at the base. There's the, the uh, viewing window plate is right here. Uh, it's got uh, painted uh, either white or cream colored. It might have turned cream through time with stencil decorations. And then you can see these two sort of stained areas. Those are rose wreaths put on the lid of the coffin before they uh, put the vault lid on. And we had both fragments of the roses, uh, wire, uh, uh, wreath parts, and then the ribbons on there. And here's a little detail of the stencil decorations. Uh, this coffin is, uh, the complete coffin is over at the Arizona State Museum. Uh, they had to put it in the freezer because uh, of the problems with termites. The, uh, the other more elaborate coffin, we contacted the, the Improved Order of Redmond, which still exists, their national office is in Waco, Texas. And they uh, had a meeting and decided that uh, no, they did not want to pay to rebury these people. Um, and so these human remains and portions of the coffins are over in the Arizona State Museum collection. Interior decorations, uh, generally the coffins on the inside were fabric lined. We had pillows and mattresses on some of them. The mattresses were basically cloth with uh, newspaper stuff inside of them, and that's where the pillows. Um, in some cases, we have model numbers that were written or stamped uh, on them, but we have not been able to find the corresponding uh, uh, model numbers in the catalogs yet. And tombstones. So after you were buried, uh, generally there would be some sort of marker put up. Um, poor people might only have some stones or a wooden uh, uh, marker. And again, none of the wooden markers from the Court Street Cemetery have survived. Uh, over at the Arizona Historical Society, they have one of the wood markers from the National Cemetery, the Alameda Stone Cemetery, for a guy named James Barrett, who was killed at the Battle of Picacho Peak in 1862. Uh, by the late 1870s, they started to import uh, gravestones over land, um, bringing them in freight wagons, which must have been a very difficult proposition. Once the uh, Railroad got here in 1880, you could order tombstones, and very soon uh, a quarry opened up in the Santa Rita Mountains, and you could have a tombstone made here in Tucson by a local carver. We don't have a lot of information on this on the probate files, which I've read through. I've read through the first 1,200 or so, and I don't think I've ever even seen a mention of a tombstone yet. Back. Oh, oh here's a oh, note. This is from the Redmond plot. Here's a, a stone marker still in place in front of a child's grave. Uh, this is the, when we pulled up the vault lid, this is the one with the little bluebirds on top of a child about a year old. And Don, if you go over to uh, 
Calling Hope Cemetery, you drive in the southern entrance and go down a little bit, you'll see some of these locally carved tombstones. Here's uh, Benita Elias, who has fat little cherubs um, and a, a, I don't know, a dove or a pigeon. And there's lambs uh, as well. So how many burials were in the Court Street Cemetery? Uh, memorize these numbers, I'll be testing you. Um, so again, most of the lower ones from the GAR is the Grand Army of the Republic. Those were all picked up and moved. The volunteer firemen, the Benai Barif, Masons, Knights of Pythias, Workmen, Redmen. Probably most of those were moved. Although you, I, you, know, you never know for sure. I know that the, um, I've actually, for some reason I don't have the, the independent order of articles. That one is an empty lot right now. It hasn't got anything built on it. And I'd love to run a ground penetrating radar across it. The Catholic Cemetery, that's based on the Catholic burial records as well as uh, the uh, death records, death certificates that mention people that are not mentioned in the Catholic burial records. The city and county is where uh, Protestants as well as poor people were buried. And the total we have now is 6,400. I think there's probably another couple thousand that, that have not been uh, found yet in the records. And I'm still, just this week, or last week, I found another 20 or so. Um, when I found another source of records that I didn't know existed. So again, uh, of the 21 graves I've excavated since 2005, 13 were exhumed, which is 62%, but eight had not been exhumed. And in every case in the exhumed examples, there were human remains, clothing, coffins, and vaults left behind. So I estimate somewhere around 1,700 people are completely unexumed in that area. And again, the house lots in the Catholic portion have between 90 and 100 of graves. I would not recommend buying a house there. <laughs> All right, that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs>
I mean, it's a cemetery where there's actual tombstones, and he was going to just bulldoze it to build something. Um, there are companies out on the east coast of the United States that specialize in cemetery removal, and that's all they do is go to people's property and remove uh, graves. Yes? So the fact that there were all these uh, bones left behind, uh, is, it, is it your speculation that when people went to move a grave, they opened up what they could get, put the bones in some other box, and yep. left everything else behind? They, the, the workers, uh, I mean, they're poorly paid guys being hired by the funeral home. Uh, number one, again, it was in the middle of summer when they were being exhumed. They had to dig down uh, in a narrow shaft, bust open the vault and then the coffin, and then reach into whatever was there. And they didn't care. I mean, it was their relatives. And so, yeah, they would grab what they could. And um, if it was a family member doing it, they might be more exact, but I suspect that very few family members were interested in doing this. Yeah. Yes. Two questions. One is, were there any religious ceremonies that occurred when they disinterred? And I'm probably not the only one who wants to know, are the international improved order of Redmond still exist and they still drink like fish? Um, <laughs> we do not know if there were any religious ceremonies during the exhumation process back in 1915. Uh, recently, uh, in the spring of this year, all of the bodies from the Catholic cemetery um, as well as uh, some other bodies from uh, the Presidio Cemetery, and there's a scattering of other bodies that have been found in downtown Tucson were reburied with a ceremony in Holy Hope Cemetery. The uh, uh, bodies from the Alameda Stone Cemetery are out in All Faith Cemetery, except for the Native American ones, which were reburied um, on their nations. And I don't know, I mean, if you go to the Redmonds, they have a Facebook, a Facebook page, a, uh, a web page. They don't mention getting drunk. They're, they're more of a philanthropic organization nowadays. They offer scholarships for kids. And they've gotten rid of the no Native Americans requirement, thankfully. <laughs> yes? How common was it for them to double or even triple stack? I took out one of the ones back in the 80s. Yes. And we were down four or five feet solid, took out the one body, and the minute we left, they stuck another shovel in the ground, and Rich had to go down and take out one that was below. And if that, that would have been in the 80s sometime. Yeah, that was in like 1981. Yeah, something like that. Um, and, and we were, Walt Berkeley told me at that time that, that it was really common, from what they were finding, to have them double, triple, and even triple stacked in a grave. And that when they there had been paid to move the cemetery when they were doing all of this, and they when they did it, they only moved the top layer. And so it wouldn't surprise me. Um, there, are, I think there have been three cases of stacked burials so far out of the approximately 50. So that's probably, I think there's the two, two, and maybe a third with three people. If you look at the, bar uh, the, the, the death records that I've accumulated, um, there are three or four people dying every day uh, in many cases, especially times when there's uh, epidemics. And so, instead of digging, you know, three graves in a row, if you dig one shaft, right. maybe seven or eight feet, you can cram in three coffins quite easy. Especially if, during times of epidemics uh, or cases where people had no living relatives to uh, protest, that was just the way it was. See, and that's what they were saying at that time. What the thought was that what we were finding in burials were not the top layer; it was the ones that were below them. So we were never finding the top people oh. because they had actually been moved to Holy Hope or wherever. Yeah, you know, I think many of the ones that we have been finding were the only ones in the graves. It's just like the Redmond plot we know for certain. All right. One, yes. After the cemetery was exhumed, the people who bought property and built on it, were they under the belief that it was completely cleared or they didn't care? Or what, what's the story? So, having human burials on your property is considered a hazardous condition, like having an underground fuel storage tank. A few years ago, the uh, city of Tucson and Pima County thought, well, maybe we should send notices to all the property owners in the Court Street Cemetery to <laughs> let them know. Well, someone pointed out in their legal department that the state of Arizona had 
passed a law that said that if you do anything to harm the value of a property, that you could be sued for the <coughs> property value. So Pima County and, and uh, City of Tucson decided, no, we better not send out notices to the property owner because a few of them are probably sue happy and would be glad to get the property money. As well as, you know, if you did that, you actually didn't lose a property, you just got a pile of cash. There are uh, a couple of signs in the roundabouts now that have Court Street Cemetery on it, so I'm imagining most people in the neighborhood do know. Although when we did the Redmond plot, there was a rental house next door, and the guys there were like absolutely blown away that we were digging up graves, <laughs> literally <laughs> 10 feet from their house. I'll answer one more question. Yes? In the First Nation animation, how was tribe affiliation determined? Well, we actually have not found any First Nation graves on our projects yet, or Native American graves. Uh, when they did the Alameda Stone Cemetery, they went to each of the groups and asked them about uh, specific burial customs that might be found that would allow them to identify Native American graves. And when you combine that with the osteological research, you, they identified a number of people that were uh, Apache, Yaki, and Tohono O'odham. All right, well, thank you for listening. To